Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Deirdre Brock. Question one, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, and let me start by paying tribute to my right honourable friend, uh, the former Member of Parliament for Whitney, David Cameron. He, he has been a tremendous public servant, both for his Whitney constituency but also for the country as, as a whole. And under his leadership, we saw the economy being stabilised. We saw more people in work than ever before. We saw people on low incomes being taken out of paying tax altogether. And this government will build on that legacy by extending opportunity to all parts of the, of the country. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Deirdre Brock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the Prime Minister couldn't tell us whether she was in favour of staying in the single market. Yeah. Now, as an Edinburgh MP, can I tell her um, how important the financial sector is to Scotland's economy? I wonder, therefore, if she can tell us whether she agrees with her Foreign Secretary that passporting for financial services is guaranteed to continue after the UK leaves the European Union. <laughs> I, I'm not going to give the Honourable Lady any different answer from the answer that I gave the House on many occasions last week, which is, which is that this Government will be working to ensure the right deal for the United Kingdom in trade, in goods and services. And that includes listening to the uh, concerns that the Scottish Government may wish to raise for us, that the governments in Northern Ireland and Wales will uh, raise with us as well. We will be fully engaged with the devolved administrations. But I say to the Honourable Lady, as I said last week, that actually the best thing for the financial sector in Edinburgh, the best thing for the economy of Scotland, is to be part of the United Kingdom. Will, will my right honourable friend join me in welcoming figures that show that unemployment in my constituency has halved since 2010, and, 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 and crucially that youth unemployment has fallen by 12 per cent in the last year alone? Will, will she promote the value of technical skills and science and engineering in her push for all children to have a good education that enables them to go as far as their talents and hard work will take them? Well, I'm, I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in welcoming the very good employment figures that we have seen today. As he has said, unemployment in his constituency has halved since 2010. That's because we've had an economic plan, we've built a strong economy. But he's absolutely right that as we look to providing opportunities for young people, we need to ensure that we consider those for whom a technical education, for whom skills and, uh, and a vocational education is the right route, because what we want is an education that's right for every child so they can actually get as far as their talents will take them. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the whole House will join me, my friend the member for Knowsley and Jane Kennedy, the Police and Crime Commissioner for Merseyside, in paying tribute to the police constable who was stabbed several times yesterday in the line of duty while trying to arrest a rape suspect in Highton. Can we all wish him well and a speedy recovery? I also wish the former Prime Minister well on his departure from this House and well in his future life, and I hope that the by-election in Whitney will concentrate on the issues of education and his views on selection in education. Because I want to congratulate the Prime Minister. She has brought about unity of Ofsted and the teaching unions. She's united former education secretaries on both sides of the House. She's truly brought about a new era of unity in education thinking. I wonder if it's possible for her this morning, within the um, quiet confines of this House, to name any educational experts that back her proposals on new grammar schools and more selection. Thank you. Mr Speaker, first of all, may I join the right honourable gentleman in paying tribute to the police constable uh, who was stabbed in Knowsley. Uh, one of the events that I used to look forward to going to every year as Home Secretary was the Peace Bravery Awards, because at that event we saw police officers who never know when they start their, uh, their shift what is going to happen to them. 
They run towards danger when other people would run away from it, and we owe them a great tribute and our gratitude for that. Now, I am glad that the Right Honourable Gentleman has raised the issue of education, because it enables me to point out that over the last six years uh, we have seen 1.4 million more children in good or outstanding schools. That is because of the changes that this Government introduced. It is because of the free schools, the academies, head teachers being put in charge of schools, more choice for parents, changes which I note, all of which the Right Honourable Gentleman opposes. So, what I want to see is more good school places, a diversity of provision of education in this country, so that we really see opportunity for all and young people going as far as their talents will take them. Corbyn. Mr Speaker, I asked the Prime Minister if she could name any experts that could help her in this policy, and uh, sadly she wasn't able to. So can I quote one expert at her? His name is John, and he's a teacher. And uh, he wrote to me and said, the education system and teachers have made great strides forward to improve quality and delivery of the curriculum. And he says, why not fund all schools properly and let us do the job? The evidence, Mr Speaker, of the effects of selection is this. In Kent, which has a grammar school system, 27% of the pupils on free school meals get five good GCSEs, compared with 45% in London. We are all for spreading good practice, but why does the Prime Minister want to expand a system that can only let children down? Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that he needs to uh, stop casting his mind back to the 1950s? What, uh, what, we will be, what we will be doing, what we will be doing, is ensuring that we are able to provide good school places for the one and a quarter million children who are in schools that are failing, inadequate or need improvement. Those children and the parents of those children know they are not getting the education that is right for them and the opportunities that they need. And when, it look, when we look at the impact of grammar schools, if you look at attainment on, uh, for disadvantaged and non-disadvantaged children, the attainment gap in grammar schools is virtually zero, which it isn't in other schools. It's opportunity for young people to go where their talents will take them. And I know that the right honourable gentleman, I know the right honourable gentleman believes in equality. The right honourable gentleman believes in equality of outcome. I believe in equality of opportunity. Yeah. He, he believes in levelling down. We believe in levelling up. Mr Speaker, equality, Mr. Speaker, equality of opportunity is not segregating children at the age of 11. So let me quote the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which says, those in selected areas who don't pass the 11th plus do worse than they would have done in a comprehensive system. The Secretary of State for Education suggested on Monday that new grammar schools may be required to set up feeder primary schools in poorer areas. Will the children in these feeder primaries get automatic places in the grammar school, or will they be subject to selection? What, <coughs> what we are doing is setting up a more diverse education system that provides more opportunities. And what the Right Honourable Gentleman appears to be defending is the situation we have at the moment where there is selection in our school system, but it's selection by house price. I think we want to ensure that children have the ability to go where their talents take them. And can I just remind, gently remind the Right Honourable Gentleman, he went to a grammar school, I went to a grammar school, it's what got us where we are today, but my, my side my side might be rather happier about that than his. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, 
The two things the Prime Minister and I have in common is we can both remember the 1950s and we can both remember going to a grammar school. My point is simply this. Every child, every child should have the best possible education they can have. We don't need and never should divide children at the age of 11, a life-changing division where the majority end up losing out. I notice she didn't answer my question about feeder primary schools. On Monday, the Secretary of State for Education said we have not engaged much in the reform of grammars. But the Government would now start the process. Can the Prime Minister confirm whether existing grammar schools, like those in Kent and Buckinghamshire, will now be instructed to widen their admission policies by her Government? The, the right hon. Gentleman is right that what we are looking and consulting on is a diversity of provision in education. We want to make sure that all grammar schools actually do uh, the job that we believe is important, which is providing opportunities for a wide range of pupils. And there are many examples across the country of different ways in which that is done through selective education. But he talks about the education, good education for every child. That is exactly what our policy is about. There are 1.25, one and a quarter million children today who are in schools that are not good or outstanding. There are parents today who fear that their children are not getting the good education to enable them to get on in life. I believe in the education that is right for every child. It is the Labour Party that has stifled opportunity, stifled ambition in this country. It is, it is the Labour Party that is willing members of the Labour Party who will take the advantages of a good education for themselves and pull up the ladder behind them for other people. Mr Speaker, I, I'm, I'm sorry that the Prime Minister was unable to help anyone in Kent or Buckinghamshire in the answer to my question, and presumably she will have to return to it. But it's not about pulling up ladders, it's about providing a ladder for every child. And let me quote her a critic of grammar schools. There is a kind of hopelessness about the demand to bring back grammars, an assumption that this country will only ever be able to offer a decent education to a select few. And the quote goes on to say, I want the Conservative Party to rise above that attitude. Not my words, those of the former Right Honourable Member for Whitney. Isn't he, isn't he correct that what we need is investment in all of our schools, a good school for every child, not this selection at the age of 11. What we need is a good school for every child, and that's precisely what we will be delivering with the policy that we've announced. And, uh, and with that policy, we will see we will see universities expanding their support for schools. We'll see more faith schools being set up. We'll see independent schools increasing their support for schools in the state sector. A diversity of provision of education is what we need to ensure good school places for every child. And that good school place is important so young people can take opportunities and get into the workplace. And I notice, I think this is the right honourable gentleman's fifth question. He hasn't yet welcomed the employment figures today. More, more, people, more people in work than ever before. Wages rising above inflation, that's more people with a pay packet, more, more money in those pay packets. What would Labour offer? More taxation and misery for working families. It's only the Conservative Party that knows you can only build an economy that works for everyone when everyone has an opportunity for work. Mr Speaker, of course I welcome anyone that's managed to get a job. I welcome those people that have managed to get jobs and keep themselves and their families together. The problem is that there are now almost a million of them on zero-hours contracts who do not know what they're going to be paid from one week to the other. And in order to help her with um, the expertise on the reform of secondary schools, could I quote to her Michael Wilshaw, the Chief Inspector of Schools, who said quite simply this, the notion 
that the poor stand to benefit from the return of grammar schools strikes me as quite palpable tosh and nonsense. Yeah. Isn't all this proof that the Conservative Party's Green Paper addresses none of the actual crises facing our school system? A real terms cut in schools' budget half a million pupils in supersized classes, a crisis in teacher recruitment and retention, rising number of unqualified teachers in classrooms, vital teaching assistants losing their jobs. Isn't this the case of a government heading backwards to a failed segregation for the few and second-class schooling for the many? Can't we do better than this? I have, to say, I have to say to the right honourable gentleman that he has got some of his facts wrong, plain and simple. They, we have more teachers in our schools today than in 2010. We have more teachers joining the profession than leaving it. We have fewer pupils in supersized classes than there have been previously. Uh, but I simply say this to the right honourable gentleman. First of all, that he has opposed every measure that we have introduced to improve the quality of education in this country. He has opposed measures that increase parental choice, that increase the freedom for head teachers to run their schools. He has opposed the opportunity for people to set up the free schools. These are all changes that are leading to improvements in our education system, and we will build on those with our new policies. But I, I recognise, uh, right, for the right honourable gentleman, this may very well be the last time that he has an opportunity to face me across this dispatch box. <laughs> certainly, 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 certainly if, his, certainly if his members of parliament have anything, uh, have anything to do with it. Uh, I, 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 I accept that he and I, I accept he and I don't agree on everything. Well, actually, probably we don't agree on anything. But, <laughs> But I must say to him that he has made his mark. Let's just think of some of the things that the Right Honourable Gentleman has introduced. He, he wants coal mines without mining them, submarines without sailing them, and he wants to be Labour leader without leading them. One thing we know, whoever is Labour leader after their leadership election, it will be the country that loses. Can I, just order, can I just point out to the House that progress today at this question time session has been absurdly slow. Absurdly slow. And I ask order, I ask the House, on behalf of our constituents, to show some respect for those colleagues who want to question the Prime Minister. And I am determined to get down the list. Craig Williams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Students from Cardiff schools and UK schools attended the recording of the British Holocaust survivors, giving their testimony for future generations. It was a deeply moving experience for them and a stark reminder to us to fight racism, anti-Semitism and hatred in all yeah, forms. Yeah, yeah. As part of this vital education effort, of which I know my right honourable friend is a great supporter, is the establishment of a national memorial to the Holocaust. Could my right honourable friend update us on the next stage in this? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for the comments that my honourable friend makes, and he's absolutely right that we need to ensure that we never forget the horrors of the Holocaust and the lessons that must be learned from that. And it is right that we have agreed uh, this national memorial next to Parliament on Victoria Gardens. I think that's an important place for it to be. Uh, my right honourable friend, the, com the Community Secretary, will be today launching an international competition for the design of that uh, memorial. And included among that, I think, will be the possibility of a learning centre which will ensure that there will be those opportunities for young people and others truly to learn. Uh, the the uh, lessons from the Holocaust and to learn about the appalling atrocities that took place. Brangus yeah. Robertson. Yeah. Uh, last week, the Prime Minister was unwilling or unable to give any assurances about remaining in the single European market. Today, she's been unwilling or unable to give any assurances to the financial sector about protecting the passporting of financial services. Meanwhile, millions of people from across the United Kingdom depend on freedom of movement across the EU for business and for pleasure. They face the prospect of having to apply and possibly pay for 
visas. Is the Prime Minister in favour of protecting visa-free travel? Yes or no? There was a very clear message from the British people at the time of the referendum vote on June the 23rd that they wanted that they wanted to see an end to free movement as it uh, as it operated they wanted to see control of the movement of people from the european union into the uk and that's what we will deliver angus roberts uh... mr speaker the prime minister and the uk government are totally unwilling to tell us the true cost here, of here. brexit and what their negotiating position will be in contrast there is a different tune from the European Union. Their new EU negotiator, Guy Verhofstadt, has said, and I quote, it's wrong that Scotland might be taken out of the EU when it voted to stay. Does she agree with Mr Hofstadt, the EU negotiator, and the Scottish Government, who want to protect Scotland's place in Europe? I have to say to the right honourable gentleman, it's all very well him asking that question, but only two years ago, only two years ago, he didn't want to protect Scotland's place in the European Union because he wanted Scotland to leave the UK. And, uh, and on all of these questions, whether it's the question of the referendum uh, for leaving the European Union, the referendum on independence in Scotland, or questions in this House, the right honourable gentleman seems to think that if he asks a different que- the question all the time, he'll get a different answer. Well, it won't work for me, and it won't work for the Scottish people. Victoria yeah. yeah. Atkins. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Freedom of speech is a fundamental British value, which is undermined by so-called safe spaces in our universities, where a sense of righteous entitlement by a minority of students uh, that means that their wish not to be offended shuts down debate. As students around the country return to their places of learning at the start of this new academic year, does my right honourable friend agree that university is precisely the place for lively debate and that fear of being offended must not trump freedom of speech. Well, I I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. We want our universities not just to be places of learning, but to be places where uh, there can be open debate, which is challenged, and people can, uh, can get involved in that. And I think everybody is finding this concept of safe spaces quite extraordinary, uh, frankly. We want to see that uh, innovation of thought taking place in our universities. That's how we develop as a, as a country, as a society, and as an economy. And I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. Owen Thompson. Mr Speaker, nine-year-old Mohammed is one of thousands of child refugees alone in Syria. His parents fled the country believing he was dead and have resettled my constituency of Midlothian. In March, Mohammed was identified as being alive, but has since been kidnapped, badly beaten and left for dead before uh, being refound again. He now lives in fear of daily attacks or sexual violence and assault. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with me to urgently review the steps the Government could take to reunite Mohammed with his devastated family and provide him with the support required to overcome his ordeal? Obviously, I'm, I'm not as aware of the uh, details of the individual case as the Honourable Gentleman is. The Home Secretary has heard uh, him, and if he would like to write to her with the details, I'm sure this case will be looked at. Of course, there are rules that do enable family reunion to take place, and also we are, as a country, uh, taking, uh, have committed to take a number of children who are v- particularly vulnerable, potentially vulnerable from sexual violence, from the region around Syria to ensure that we can resettle them in the UK and take them out of that fear uh, uh, that they're seeing. But I, my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, will look at the case if he cares to write to her. John Barron. What assurance can my right honourable friend give that whatever criteria comes to guide our immigration system, it will be fairer than the present system? It will no longer discriminate against peoples from outside the EU as the present system does. Yeah. The, um as I mentioned uh, earlier in response to a question, 
it is the case that one aspect of the vote on the 23rd of June was that people wanted us to control movement from the European Union into the UK, and of course we are already able to control movement from outside the European Union into the United Kingdom. And we intend to. The details of the system we'll introduce for EU citizens is uh, from those coming from the EU are currently being uh, worked on. Uh, but I can assure my honourable friend that we will have the ability to control movement from the EU and movement from outside the EU, and therefore bring that great degree of fairness that I think people were looking for. David Winnick. How can she try and justify reducing the House of Commons to 600, while the House of Lords now have 820 members, and certainly by 2020 even more? This is her idea of democracy in the 21st century. I I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman that, of course, uh, the House of Commons voted for that reduction in the number of members of Parliament. I think people wanted to see that. But I would gently, gently remind him when he refers to the House of Lords and changes in the House of Lords that it's actually this Government that has introduced the retirement procedures for the House of Lords that has seen a reduction in the number of members of the House of Lords. Lucy Fraser. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The NHS five-year forward view states that in future we will see more care delivered locally. Does the Prime Minister think that in line with that, the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough CCG ought to consider the importance of local care when assessing the future of the Princess of Wales Minor Injuries Unit in Ely? Well, my honourable friend is right. The five-year plan does include uh, that uh, proposal for local, more local input in terms of care at a local level. And it's absolutely right that in looking at, for example, the future of minor injuries units, local people should be considered and local concerns taken into account. I understand there is due to be a meeting in Ely later this month to consider this, and I hope that my honourable friend and her constituents will be able to make their views known at that meeting. Richard Burden. Mr Speaker, tomorrow I'll be helping to launch a programme at the engineering company ADI group in my constituency to boost the interests of 14 to 16 year olds in engineering skills. Now, no doubt the Prime Minister would like to join me in congratulating ADI group, but would she take it from me that her words of congratulation would mean rather more if they were not accompanied by cuts of between 30 and 50 per cent in apprenticeships funding? a programme which the Institute of the Motor Industry has described as a car crash. Well, uh, I, of course, uh, am happy to commend the uh, the company that he has referred to. And, of course, the the West Midlands are an important driver in terms of engineering skills uh, in this uh, this country. But I simply do not recognise the situation he set out in relation to apprenticeships. We have seen two million apprenticeships created over the last uh, six years. We are committed as a government to seeing more apprenticeships. Uh, being, uh, being created. That's giving young people opportunities, uh, like the young people I met when I went to Jaguar Land Rover, to ge- learn a skill, to get into uh, a, a job, to get into the workplace and to get on where their talents will take them. Yeah. Inner Bruce. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does the Prime Minister agree that the life chances of many children, particularly in our poorest areas, are limited through living in chaotic and unstable households? And would she kindly look at the all-party parliamentary children's centre group report recently produced, which recommends family hubs in local communities and other solutions to this issue, with a view to considering its service? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I say to my commend my honourable friend on the work that she's doing on the all-party parliamentary group? Uh, the 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 question of that stable background, that family background that young people are brought up in is obviously an important issue and she has been a champion for uh, families and for family life. Um, I, I, can I say to her that I have set up a, a uh, policy route for, with, uh, led by my honourable friend, the member for Mid Norfolk, and I am sure I will ask him to look very carefully at the report that has come out of the All Party Parliamentary Group and to see what, uh, what we can take from that. Alex Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Monday, the Parliamentary Advisory Group on Carbon Capture and Storage published a report about the potential of CCS to create thousands of jobs, save the country billions of pounds and play a major role in meeting the UK's emission reduction targets. CCS is critical to Teesside. So can the Prime Minister tell the House when the Government will publish its long-awaited new strategy? Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I first of all say that um, the issue of uh, climate change, of reducing emissions, and our energy policy are very important to this government. We have a fine record in this area, and we will be continuing to uh, continuing to do that. Uh, but on the issue of carbon capture and storage, this has been looked at carefully in the past. It is a, the, one of the key issues around this is the uh, is the cost. Uh, we will continue to invest in the development of CCS. We are developing over $130 million to develop the technology through innovation support with the aim of uh, reducing its costs, and so we will continue to look at the role that it can play. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. As a Governor at Neville Road Infants in Bramhall, I know that schools have to make the best use of their resources. Therefore, I was shocked to learn that schools in the North West are charged £27 million for their water charges. Will the Prime Minister agree with me that schools are important community hubs and, we, and would the Government make representations to Ofwat to change the banding guidance that schools are committed, considered community assets rather than classified in the same way as big business? Well, uh, can I first of all commend my honourable friend and others in this House who play a role as school governors, a very important role. She is right that schools need to think carefully how they are using their resources. I think the approach taken by water companies does change, but we are actually looking at the guidance to water companies uh, in, in relation to how they can uh, deal with schools and whether they could uh, be looking at schools and, and using more concessionary rates in relation to schools. Elliot. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And the Prime Minister may be aware of... Uh, last week's BBC Spotlight programme on which there were serious allegations of corruption and fraud around the NAMA sale of properties in Northern Ireland. Can the minister, Prime Minister confirm what agencies will be investigating those and if the National Crime Agency will be involved and will a report be publicly published in due course? Um, I have to say to the honourable gentleman on the specific issue that he has raised, if I may, we'll come back to him on the details of that, as he knows the National Crime Agency does operate in Northern Ireland on a slightly different basis from the basis in which it operates elsewhere across the United Kingdom, and it will be necessary if this, for the issues where they are being looked into to ensure that the appropriate skills and capabilities are brought to bear. But if you may, I will write to him with detail uh, answer to his question. Theresa Villiers. Will the Prime Minister give her full and enthusiastic support to President Anastasiades and Mustafa Akinji as they reach a crucial stage of their negotiations, which we hope will deliver a negotiated settlement for a free and united Cyprus? Yes, I am happy to join my right honourable friend uh, in uh, what she says. I think it is important. I think everybody across this House will wish these talks well and hope that they have a successful conclusion. Lisa Nandy. It has been two years since the Prime Minister set up the child abuse inquiry. It is on to its fourth chair, and last week the outgoing chair said that it had become inherently unmanageable. Since the Prime Minister appointed Dame yeah. Lowell Goddard to her position, will she insist that she comes before this House yeah, to explain yeah, yeah, herself? Yeah, yeah. Surely child abuse survivors deserve an explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, on the, on the process point that she's raised with me, of course, it's not for the Prime Minister to insist who attends before a committee of this House. I understand Dame Lowell Goddard has been invited to attend the committee. But what I would say on the child abuse issue is I think she and I share, we share across this House, many honourable members, a desire to see these issues of these appalling crimes of child abuse being properly looked into. It is important that the inquiry, uh, Dame Lowell Goddard has set up the inquiry, the Truth Project, uh, many aspects of this which are already in place and operating. Uh, and I am very pleased uh, that Alexis Jay has taken on the role as chairman of the inquiry. She chaired the Rotherham work. I think she will do this work extremely well, and we will have answers to questions that so many have been asking for too long. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Child sexual exploitation is an issue that affects many communities. Does the Prime Minister agree that shining a light on the events of the past is the best way to learn lessons in the future? And will she agree to an independent review of child sexual exploitation in Telford? Yeah. I think my uh, honourable friend has just shown the cross-party uh, uh, concern that there is on this issue of child abuse and child sexual exploitation. It is absolutely right, as my honourable friend says, that we are able to look into uh, the abuses of the past and the crimes of the past. There will be important lessons we need to learn from that as to why institutions that were supposed to protect children 
fail to protect children. Uh, it's for the authorities in Telford to look specifically at how they wish to address these issues in Telford. Um, but I'm sure, as my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has heard her comments, and I'm sure she'll want to take that up with her. Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Following the successful Hillsborough Independent Panel, will the Prime Minister now look at setting up a similar review of the biggest uh, treatment disaster in the history of the NHS, the contaminated blood scandal? Yeah. Victims are still waiting for answers and justice 35 years on. Yeah. Well, the, the Honourable Lady raises, uh, obviously raises a very important point in relation to contaminated blood. I will take the point that she has made away and, and consider it. Um, obviously, uh, as she will know, that the reasons and the, the uh, uh, background which led to the Hillsborough Independent Panel, but I recognise the concern that people have about contaminated blood and will uh, consider the point that she's made. Shailesh Vara. Mr. Speaker, the uh, Prime Minister will be aware of coverage regarding a report to be published by Dame Louise Casey, the Government's integration star. The report will speak of British laws, culture, values, and tradition, such as Christmas, being threatened by political correctness from Council officials. Will the Prime Minister take this opportunity to send a loud and clear message that the best way to secure a harmonious society? is not only for mainstream Britain to respect minority traditions such as Diwali, Vaisakhi and Eid, but also that council officials appreciate that minority communities should respect the views and traditions of mainstream Britain. And that means, and that means Christmas is not winterable and Christmas trees are not festive trees. I, I do agree with my honourable friend. Um, I'm not going to uh, comment or preempt the findings of Louise Case's work and her review, which is an important piece of work that she's doing. I will simply join him in saying this: that what we want to see in our society is tolerance and understanding. Uh, but we also we want minority communities to be able to recognise and stand up for their traditions. But we also want to be able to stand up for uh, our traditions generally as well, and that includes Christmas. Mr Speaker, would the Prime Minister look very carefully at the calls from the Royal British Legion and Poppy Scotland for new questions to be added to the next census so that we can better meet the needs of our serving personnel in the armed forces, our veterans and their families? And in Northern Ireland, where such a massive contribution is made to the armed forces in terms of recruitment and service, would she look carefully at the distribution of funding under the Armed Forces Covenant so that there is equitable funding across all regions and countries of the United Kingdom? Yes. Well, I say to the right honourable gentleman that, of course, I am pleased that it was this government that introduced the military covenant and has recognised the importance of uh, that, uh, that bond and that, uh, that link with uh, those who are serving in our armed forces, but also the importance uh, in terms of uh, veterans in our armed, uh, our armed forces. I haven't seen the specific request from the Royal British Legion and, and Poppy Scotland. Uh, I will certainly, that will certainly be looked at by the Cabinet Office when considering the next census. Mr David Trudinick. Does she agree that the cooperation between Russia and the United States in respect of Aleppo sets a very important precedent and that it is in the British national interest to redevelop our links with Russia and then we may be able to solve many more problems in that region. Well, my, right, my honourable friend is right that the uh, agreement that has been reached between Syri uh, Russia and the United States about Syria is an important agreement, and I think everybody in this House will want to see that uh, working, being put into practice and actually working on the ground. I would say there have been a number of occasions where we have seen what appear to be steps forward, and sadly it has not been possible to implement them, but I hope that this will be different uh, uh, this time, and I think it would mark an, in, an important step. But in relation to Russia, I should think we should have no doubt uh, about uh, the relationship we should have with Russia. It is not a business-as-usual relationship. I made that very clear when I was responding to the report on the uh, uh, murder of Litvinenko, and uh, we should continue with, uh, with that position. George Howarth. Can I join with my right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, the Prime Minister, Jane Kennedy, the police and uh, crime commissioner on Merseyside, in commending the bravery, the tremendous bravery, of the police officers involved in the stabbing incident in my constituency yesterday. And also 
for, despite that, apprehending the suspect? And will the Prime Minister acknowledge that the police, often in very dangerous circumstances, are being asked to do more and more with fewer and fewer resources? Well, I, I, once again, I join the uh, honourable gentleman, right honourable gentleman, in recognising the. Uh, work of the individual police constable, as he says, apprehending uh, the, the, the three police constables, I apologise, three police constables, in apprehending uh, while being under attack. I think, as I said earlier, our police officers bravely go where others wouldn't go in order to protect the public. Uh, they uh, do so much in the line of duty, but also for some when they're off duty as well. Uh, uh, they're prepared to go and face danger in order to protect us. Uh, on the issue of resources, I would simply remind him that, of course, we have protected police budgets uh, over the period of the Comprehensive Spending Review Settlement. Uh, in, in the face of a proposal from his front bench that we should cut them by 5 to 10%. Order.